you have a Bible, there's uh, one in front of you, Second Peter. We started this last Sunday. Who you here last Sunday? Raise your hand. And where were y'all that weren't here? Supporting a church with bad leaders. And I missed all of you. What's that? Who said that? Oh, there. Yeah. Okay. Um, God bless you for being here. Second Peter. Big Peter, chapter one. Are you there yet? Equally, and 
the stuff that they made, the computer say, got a lot of water, you know, you know, same place, of what? What's the word? Equal standing. We've obtained this for those in Christ. We have this equal standing. We have the same thing as him with ours by the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. So we, we talked a lot about this, that Peter says that we have this equal standing through Christ, the same that Peter has, the same, the faith that he has, that's the same faith that's in us. And so when we think about that, we think about, well, well how do we get this? And, and the, the answer is by the righteousness of God, our Savior Jesus Christ. And so we have this equalness by, not of our own standing, not of our own works, not not because we, we just... We just have this incredible faith and other people don't. We have this because what? The righteousness of Jesus Christ. Remember we talked about that? About where the cross is kind of an equalizer? And that through the cross of Jesus Christ that we receive His righteousness. It's not our righteousness, but it's His righteousness. So all the work that Christ did on Calvary is because uh, that work gives us the, the right to be called children of righteousness and he puts on us our righteousness. And so I kind of illustrated that. I said, you know, when Jesus came, uh, you know, I, I've been wanting a white robe. And uh, to give illustration, I've done this several times. And I tried to illustrate that by... I should have been tired. How does this work? <laughs> <laughs> so Donna ordered this and uh, I didn't even put this thing on. But I've used this illustration several times. And so she said, you've got to have a white robe, you know, to make this look like it. And so what I talked about was when Jesus came, what did he say? He, he clothed himself what? In humanity. He put on humanity. But remember who he was. He was righteous. He was blameless. He was pure. He was without any garbage in his right. Right? You with me? All right. I want to make this real short because I used it last Sunday. And so I want you to visualize this because this is Christ. And when he came, he, uh, through, through the cross of Calvary, what he did, he disrobed this robe of righteousness and he took on what? He took on what? Our sin. Remember, I uh, was a jacket. I actually brought my jacket. Okay. Y'all didn't really believe me. I had a, a jacket here. And this jacket kind of represents, uh, you know, high school days. And, and I told you, you know, this was a jacket that kind of represents, you know, playing football and all this. And my old life, if you would, before I really committed to Jesus Christ, this is my badge of dishonor. I mean, my badge of honor. And, 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 I, and I, I wore this in seminary because I didn't have a jacket. And uh, what a mistake. Look, it's ripped. It's got paint all over it, you know. And I go to my 40th reunion. I can't even wear this thing. I can't fit it. I'm not going to try it on. <laughs> You know, I'm not going to try to embarrass y'all, but some of y'all didn't believe I could wear it. But my point is this, is that this was a stupid mistake. Getting paint on there and ruining it. You know, you know what I'm saying? So here's what happened. This kind of represents all my garbage of my past life. And what Christ did, he disrobed of this, his righteousness, his purity, his perfection, and he put on my jacket, my garbage, my fit. That's what he did. And sometimes we don't see that, do we? And today's Palm Sunday when Christ comes in, knowing all along what He's about to do, He's about to take on all of your sin and all of my sin and all of the world's sin. And so He, he took on, He replaced my garbage and He put it on. That's exactly what He did. And the neat thing about this is, is that now, what does He say? He, through Christ Jesus, because He did that, we now have the robe of His righteousness. And so every time God looks at you, you know what He looks at? He sees this robe of His Son's righteousness in your life. Now you've got to get this so you get this. And I know that's hard to believe we just say, man, I, I just don't feel this. And, you know, and, and what does this really mean? It means because of Christ's righteousness, we have that same faith. And then the verse 2, remember what we talked about? It talked about that because, because of Christ, because of the sacrifice that He made, and that He gives us this equal standing of grace and what? What does it say? Verse 2. Grace and what? He said peace. Peace. That's right. And then He said this, not only do you have grace and peace, but you have multiplied grace and peace. And we have this question, well, how do we get this? I think it came on the here or something. The world, it's, it's too late. Am I on this thing? Is this? No. Now, Tom, you hear that right there? No. What? 
Let's go ahead, stay right there. I'm good. We're on top of it. And so, uh, <laughs> I have no idea where I'm at. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know that. We're in the Christian church. Yeah. <laughs> so today I'll be on the test. I have no idea. I'm just going to go over those here. All right. In verse 2, it says that we have this equal standing of grace and peace. Now, how many of y'all need grace and peace in your life? How many of y'all, what's it? How many of y'all need grace and peace multiplied in your life? Yeah. Raise both hands on that one. He says it's available. We just have to believe that, don't we? Wait a minute. I thought if I, you know, kind of pretty good guy and be good guy and all this, I'm going to have grace and peace. And it's not about me, is it? It's all about what Jesus did and believing that, that he lives in me. And because he lives in me and I'm growing in him, I have this multiplied of grace and peace. That's pretty cool, isn't it? How do I get that? <coughs> Verse 2, again, is through knowing Jesus Christ. That's how we get grace and peace. And the more I know him, the more that grace and peace is multiplied in my life. Y'all believe that? If you believe that, then probably many of y'all are reading. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get you on this. Y'all are reading what I ask you to read because the more you read the Word of God and the more you fellowship with Him, the more you get to know the Lord. Every verse that we're going to look at, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4, talk about everything is found in Christ, but it's multiplied by our knowledge and our intimacy with Him. That's the key. All right, new stuff. Verse 3. Verse 3. Life and Godliness. So, what we've talked about so far, this, this has really got to go. Mike, come up here. Come here. Just, I've got, a, I got things hanging out. Look at this. Things hanging out. And if the electrical, the electrical storm comes, I'm doing it. What? Let's look at verse 3, okay? Let's read this together. Or I'll just read it. What? Okay. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory in excellence. Here's what it says here. His divine power has granted to us all things. That's a pretty, that's a pretty crazy statement, isn't it? His divine power has granted to all us, all things that pertain to life and godliness. His divine power has granted, in other words, what we got to understand the divine power of this, this dunamis power, this unbelievable power of God. Do you think God can do anything that He wants? Absolutely. Do you think God controls everything in this world? Absolutely. I, I've resolved that in my life. I hope you have too. But God contrains, controls and contains and creates everything according to to his power and his strength. The Bible says his hand is not short. His power is all-encompassing, right? Right, church? His power is all-encompassing. He's, he's not <coughs> deficient in any area of his life. That's who God is. His power, his awesomeness, is we cannot imagine, we cannot even fathom with our mind the awesomeness and power of it. Notice that his divine power has granted in other words, it's not how we get it or how we, we beg for it, but He grants it according to His mercy through Christ Jesus. That's what the Word of God said. So He grants that to us. Let me kind of give you an illustration. Let's say you're in a prisoner of war camp, okay? And all of a sudden you're in this prisoner of war camp, you know, just the, the hiddenness of it and the, 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 you know, just the detrimentalness of, of being in this, this, this prisoner of war. And all of a sudden, let's say the the captain of, of, of this army comes to you. He says, I've got, uh, I'm going to release ten people. And you're all standing there. And I'm going to choose ten people that I'm going to release. And you're going to get to go home to your family. You're released. You have total freedom in that. All right? Kind of get the picture here? And you're standing there. You've been a prisoner in this war camp for years. And you're standing there. And he's selecting those. He's granting through his power that he's, he's giving you permission to do that. This is what the Lord has done for us. We've been... Prisoners. We, the Bible says we are slaves to sin. We, we are captive by sin and evil of this world. 
And Christ comes to our life and He grants us, he, he, he looks at us and He says, I've given you this privilege of life and liberty and freedom. And once I set you free, you're done with this. You're free indeed. Right? Isn't that the scripture? And so when I read this, that His divine power has granted to us. Who is us? Those who have faith. Those who have peace. Those who have grace in their life. The, the scriptures that we've been looking at. Those who have knowledge of Christ Himself. He's granted to us all things. That's pretty, that's pretty crazy. All things. All things. In other words, nothing is lacking in your life. We're on this equal level. When God looks at us, He says, In you, I've given you all things. I've granted to you all things. You are not lacking nothing in your spiritual life. Now, we just don't, we don't really believe that, do we? <laughs> By the quietness of your response, I think you probably just said, yeah, that's right. I mean, we all feel just insufficient and inadequate, you know, and we, we you know, we mope around as Christians, you know, I just, I don't have enough faith, I don't have enough grace, I don't know, I have strength, and, and, and you know what the Lord says? That's a lie, because it's in you, it's within you. Through Christ, <coughs> who lives in you, you are complete, you are sufficient, all things, you are on the people level. And so when I read this, I, I think God empowers us, let's go to the next second here. God empowers us now, those of us who have faith and grace and peace, with everything we need for a godly life. You know, oftentimes we, we uh, use that scripture verse, you know, I can do all things through Christ, and we see that, you know, uh, uh, you know, I can do all things, I can be the best athlete that I can through Christ, I can be the best. You know, really the purpose of this all things through Christ, it's really to live a godly life. And we just, we read this as, as clear as we can. And what, what it says here, that God empowers us. I can do all things through Christ. God empowers us with everything we need to live a godly life. <coughs> That's the problem. I mean, are, 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 being honest, do you, do you fully say, you know, I, I have this this unbelievable power in me, I know this power in me to live this godly life, but I'm, I'm right on track, I'm living this godly life. But I know we all sin, we all, you know, the Bible says we're all sinners, I, I, I get that, but, but what is the problem with really encompassing and grabbing the scripture verse and, and applying it to our lives? Sometimes I think we think well, God's kind of stingy, you know? He gives it to some, and they just, oh, they're, they're just, you know, kind of Mother Teresa syndrome, you know, like, oh, that she just has that grace and that peace about her. I'm just using her example. Oh, I don't know her. Or, or we could take me. And so, you know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know, we look at other people and say, man, they've got grace, they've got peace, they've got faith, you know, and I just don't have that much. And we just kind of shrug our shoulders and just live that way. I don't think God wants us to live that way, based on the scripture verse. I think God wants us to realize today that He's given us everything to live according to the promises He gives. Let me show you some scripture first. I just have that four up here that I don't just want to talk about to show you what I mean by this. Notice First Corinthians three twenty one. We're gonna be in First Corinthians. <coughs> first Corinthians three twenty one. So let no one boast in men, for all things are what? All things are men. So in Christ, we don't we don't boast in the fact of who we are, how strong we are, my personality, but who we boast in, we boast in the Lord. And the strength of all things is. Next verse. First Corinthians 2 9. But as it is written, what I have, uh, what what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of men imagined, what God has prepared for those who what? So we can't we can't fathom the things that God has prepared for us. We can't see it, we can't feel it, we can't hear it hard, we can't hear it. What God has really prepared for us, you know? Don't you ever think that when you get to heaven, you, you know, you kind of think, well, maybe I missed out on some, some of the promises of the Lord and what He really had for me? Do you ever think that way, you know? And you say, man, what if I die? And I, do I, God, do I ever, when you're praying in your quiet time, you ever say, Lord, am I really missing you? Is there something more in my life? And here's what the scripture says, you know what? Whatever you imagine, and you can't imagine the fathom and the, and the the power that he has for you, the things he's done. Second Corinthians, look at that scripture verse. And God is able to make all grace abound in you, so that having all sufficiency in what? All things that what? So all sufficiency at all times in all things in all ways. You're not lacking anything. 
You may what about in every good word. So, how do we get this all sufficiency and everything that we need from God to live a godly life? Here's the answer. It only comes in that in that last verse, in that last part of, of verse two. It only comes to the knowledge of Him. To the knowledge of Him. Now, most of us are we probably say, "Well, you know, I know God." And most of us in this room, we know some things about God. And most of us in this room, we say, you know, I've got some theology about God. Is that really what this is talking about? You must be very careful about this because really every every uh, demon in hell has pretty good theology about God. You know? They know about God. They've got some pretty good understanding about who God is. So that they have a good concept of who God is. They have pretty good theology. So it's really not this intellectual knowledge about God. It's got to be something else. Would you not agree? And so this word to know is epigeno, epigeno, not epigenos, but epigenos. And that word means an intimate fellowship with God. This, this intimacy that comes where you really know and you really understand and you really have this, this relationship with God. In the Old Testament, they used this word in the same references as, as when Cain knew his wife and she bore a son. Now let me tell you, in that, in that experience, in that relationship, you know that that just went ahead and on, right? It wasn't like Cain said, well, you know, I know my wife, and I know she's a woman, and I know she can have kids, and uh, I, I know the possibility of having kids, and boom, she has a kid, right? It didn't work that way last time I checked, right? You know what I mean? In that same regard, it's that, that, that coming together, that intimacy, that same respect, and not in that sexual way we're talking about. We're talking about in that intimate fellowship and, and that exposure of oneself and completely giving yourself to that other person. It's in that knowledge that that same context comes. That this is the way that we're to know about Christ and to know about the Lord. is that intimate relationship with Him and that fellowship that we, we have with Him. And that's what that word means, to know. To, to have this knowledge. And you know what Jesus said? He said the greatest, the greatest commandment of all is to know great theological issues and facts about God, right? The greatest commandment of all is to really understand the theological perspective of the ecological ec type of uh, explanation of, of the deity. It's not that at all. What Jesus says is, he said the greatest commandment of all is what? Isn't that a weird scripture verse? 
Somebody says, I know you, and then Jesus says, no, I didn't know you. Is there, do you think there's a problem here? And the problem is just what I just tried to explain to you. He says, it's not just intellectual knowledge, because demons know the existence of God, right? You know, Peter said that. And they tremble, because they know who God is. But they don't have this intimate relationship with God. And that's the difference. So, so today, today, what this scripture verse says to me, it says, if, if, if I'm going to live a godly life, I must have this intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. But in me, listen, in me, he grants the power to live a godly life because of the relationship I have through Jesus Christ to God. That's how I'm going to win this thing. Verse 4. We have great we have equal opportunity with great promises in divine name. Verse 4. Again, notice this, he grants. Same process. It all comes from God. He's the one that looks to us and says, I give you this. And so God is God is an equal opportunity. Just remember? When he looks at you, when he looked at you, he called you, he granted you this freedom, and he gave you, he gave you that freedom because of your faith and trust and your allegiance to him and your decision to follow him. He grants us this righteousness through Christ, his son. You got that? And so once again, he does this granting, this giving. It's not in our own works, we see him but it's all about the righteousness of Christ on Calvary. All right? It's so important that we get this. It's not by works, but it's by the righteousness of Christ. We have this relationship. By which he has granted to us his precious. Peter used that about five different times, that word precious. We'll look at that a little bit more later. We're not going to do that today. His precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, have escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. I think it's kind of an interesting verse because I, I, mean, I really struggled with this of trying to understand this because so often when we think of the promises of God, what do you think about? When you think about, some of you have, some, maybe you have those, that little thin book, you know? I used to have one of those. I'm not sure if I have that anymore. And it says the promises of God and it kind of gives topical, you know, when you're discouraged or when you're fearful, there's scripture verses of the promises of God. Anybody have that one of those books? You have one of those books? Okay. What are some of the promises of God in, in, in those? So, come on, respond. I'll never leave you off what? I'll never leave you off yeah, the presence of God. When we feel like there's, you know, God's left me and I feel alone, then the promise is I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's what the means like. What, what else? Okay, somebody else. Come on. What? Okay. That, that, that God through Christ Jesus will meet all our needs uh, according to his riches in Christ Jesus, which means all sufficiency, right? Yeah. He promises us that we will become more like him. Okay. Yeah. There's a promise that we'll be changed from glory to glory, the process of being changed, yeah? Anybody else? He's coming back. Yeah, he's coming back. Yeah. That he never changes. What? Yeah, he's the same yesterday, today, forever. Yeah, God's faithful. He changes that constant about him. Well, that's a good scripture verse. Let's remember that right now because that, we read this and we go, I asked for Peter, and Peter said, that's for you. You know, y'all hear that? You know, he's kind of going back and forth. And we go, Peter, no, that's Peter. Now, Peter in the Peter in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, no, we go, that's us, you know. Flaky, loudmouth, presumptuous, wishy-washy. I'll walk up. I can't walk up. And then we read him in Acts. What happened to him? We go, oh, I saw Peter that I know. But it's the same guy. So bad. Two more. His love endures forever. Who's speaking? What? His love endures forever. His love endures forever. Never, never. His mercy and grace goes before us. What? Who else? I saw one sh shy hand go. What? He'll come for us. He'll come for us? Comfort or come? Come for us. Come for us. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else? What's that? He'll always be with you. Yeah. There's no temptation too great that he can't defeat you. He gives us a lot. And what? He gives us a lot. He gives us a lot. He never lies. Never lies. We can depend on that. Put your foot down on that one. He never lies. 
And these are pretty good promises. So we hear these promises, and a lot of times we take these promises, and we kind of get from here, get from there, and it kind of gives us hope and direction here. And, and so when I read these scripture verses, there's so many times I've struggled with this, you know, because I really want to understand, what are these promises of God? Does God have to give me any promises? What? No. <laughs> you know? He, he doesn't have to promise me. He's God. Don't get that? God can do whatever He wants to. He can say, you believe me or not. You're on your own. <laughs> but He doesn't, does he? He gives these promises. Why does He give these promises? I read an author the other day when I, I've been reading. I said, Y'all see my desk. It's full of notes about this, this scripture verse. I'm, I'm struggling with this because I, I, I really want to get this. And one author said there's over 300,000 promises in the Word of God. I don't know where he gets that, but most of them say anywhere from three to 5,000 promises. But, but you kind of get this. There are a lot of promises. Why did God spend a lot of time telling us about these promises? Why? And so I asked this over and over. I want to know. I want to know. And here's. Kind of, here's what it came up with. Here's, here's, here's this. The purposes of God's promise is that we may share this deep spiritual union with God in order to escape this corruption, this world. Now just let that soak in just for a minute because I really want to talk about that just real quick. I'm almost through. The purpose of God's promises is that we may share this deep spiritual union. Let's stop right there. What does that mean, this deep, that deep spiritual union? Notice what it says here, that we are what? Partakers. We are partakers. That word partakers is, is the word we get fellowship. Koinonia, but it's koinonois in, in the Greek right here. We get the word fellowship. And so when it says that we are Partakers that we are in fellowship with God. Now, now understand what this word fellowship really means. It means that God actually, let, listen to me, some of you may not believe this, but God actually lives within us. Now, does that, I mean, some of you Baptist people out here, you've heard that all your life. Yeah, he lives there. He's somewhere here. I don't, I don't know. He's, 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 he's here. I was taught that in Sunday school. My Sunday school teacher would never lie to me. God, God didn't lives in me. And then we just live the way we want to. And God's present is there. He lives within us. Do you see a problem here? How about if I can live with you for a week? Do you see this? We're born with a human nature, right? In this human nature, we, we tend to, when we're left by ourselves, we do detrimental things to it, right? If, if there's no accountability, no change in my heart, I'm going to take the way we go every single time. All right? And so, so we're born with this human nature, and, and, and we're going to kill ourselves, and we're going to die, and, and, and it's going to be disastrous if we go that direction. Notice what it said. We are partakers of the divine nature. So in Christ, He fellowships with us. There's that intimate relationship with Him. That fellowship means that He actually tabernacles, what we talked about last week. He tabernacles with us. He lives within us. His divine nature. He's changed that old sin nature because of Christ. And He's created a new nature through Christ Jesus, right? And it is a divine nature. It's not like I'm not going to cuss anymore. It's like I don't have that desire to go that way because I have a divine nature. Do you understand that? And here's what's, what's happening in our world today. New Age says this, is that you are spiritual beings. And you have God living in you. You just have to release that, that God nature in you because He's always in there. He's always in Because you are a child of God already. He made you. You're children of God. And that's a lie from hell. You only tell you why it's a lie from hell because it takes Jesus completely out of the picture in our lives. To say, you don't need Jesus, you already have that divine nature. And this, the Word of God just says, you don't have that in you, but you are partakers I grant you this fellowship. I choose to come into your life and live with you. You are partaking of my fellowship. And I choose that. I grant that because of Christ Jesus. Isn't that good? 
Man, when I'm on my own, my nature, man, this jacket reminds me, I was, I was lost. I didn't make good choices here. I had a lot of garbage in my life. But I'm no longer that through Christ Jesus. Amen? I'm no longer that way. So, so this new age teaching out there, and even even among even among so-called established evangelical churches, it's still out there. And that's why we don't call sin sin anymore, do we? We just can you alter your life a little bit and add Jesus to your life and, and everything. It's not it's not adding Jesus. Jesus is everything to me. He's the one that changed me. And he lives in me. Partakers. Before Christ. I don't, I don't know if I have the next one. Do I have the next one? No, I don't have the next one. Before Christ, uh, before the promise of the God that came into my life, there was, there was this absence of this intimate fellowship in my life. My testimony is this. I went to church. Uh, you know, I, I tried to do good things, but there's always that, in, that that absence of really peace in my life. But when I gave my heart and life to Jesus Christ, there was that fulfillment. And why is that? And also that intimate relationship. Why is that? Why do we have these promises of God? And why does He live within us? And here's the answer, right? Here, is to escape the corruption of this world. Sin, sin comes at us like this. We begin to kind of look at this. just go back to the, the, the Eve and Adam and Eve. So by the way, Adam was even, you know, there at the garden. We sometimes just think it's Eve, you know, she's the one looking at the fruit. You know what the Bible really says? That they were both there. Sorry guys. So when they, when they began to look at this this tree, the guy says, No. Remember what they did? The, the Bible says that, that Eve began to look with her eyes and she said that was a appeasing to her Eyes that look good, you know? And that's how sin, Satan had really changed that tactic, has he? he? He throws things at them, and that looks pretty good. Yeah, yeah, you know? Oh, I better not today. Then tomorrow they say, well, today's a new day, you know? And you know how it is, you know how it works. Don't be smiling like I'm the only one that's ever felt like that. Yeah, well, we we say, yeah, you know, I, you know, and then, then all of a sudden we began to handle it and feel it and say, man, I think it'll taste good. And all of a sudden the vain imagination takes over. And then we say, I think I'll be happy if I go ahead and do this. And we just bite into that. And this vortex of temptation just sucks us down every time. That's a corruption of this world. And here's what the Bible says. It says, I've given you this promise so that you can escape the corruption of this world. Somebody quoted that promise that no temptation, no temptation shall what? Overcome you. Why is that? Because we have the promises of God living in us. And He promised that He'll never leave us, He'll never forsake us, He's always going to be with us, He's not a liar. He gives all these promises to us. And He says, why do I give these promises so that you will not be tempted and fall, you'll, not, you'll be tempted, but you'll not fall into temptation, you'll not be in this vortex and get sucked down because my grace and my peace and my faith and my God, that godly life that I've instilled in you, that's in you because of Christ, you don't have to go that direction. That's what he says. So why are the promises of God? The promises of God, so we'll have this, this, this intimate, vivacious relationship with Him so that we will not be sucked into the corruption of this world. So this week I want to challenge you. I've challenged some men in, 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 uh, in, our, in our little group that, that when we read in Proverbs, we're to write one of those verses and we're to memorize that for what the promises of God or what the God is speaking to us. I want to challenge you as we take one promise this week. Find a promise and latch onto that promise. Memorize it, meditate on it, and, 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 and just take it with you all day long. The Bible says put it on your forehead. We won't let you you get that blood <laughs> you, you look kind of weird, but that's okay. I'll say, right on your forehead, right on your right forehead, whatever it takes, whatever it takes, get that promise in your life and use it this way. It may be, you may be frustrated, you may feel alone in your life, and you say, you know, today, Lord, I, I'm going to take that promise that you said your presence would never leave me nor forsake me, that you're going to be in my life. I'm going to take that verse, I'm going to, I'm going to believe that verse, and here's what happens. When that temptation comes, 
for you to be angry about circumstances. Maybe somebody said something bad about you, and you you know you feel alone. You're going to isolate yourself. You're going to use that scripture verse just to build up you that you're not going to sin in that in that situation, but you're going to take that promise and say, "Listen, Lord, you live within me. I can't even go that direction because you live in me. I am the temple of the living God." Let me tell you, the mark, the mark of sonship is divine power. That's the mark. Are you really born again? then you have this divine power. That's what that scripture verse says. That divine nature lives with you. That is the mark of who you are. Is that divine nature. The mark of, this is the mark of that divine nature is this godly lifestyle. See, it's not about following a bunch of rules. But because Christ lives in me, He has clothed me with His righteousness. And this is how God looks at me. He looks at me with his son's righteousness. He looks through this, and this is how he sees me. And, and because of that, I am a child of God because I trust him. And he'll do my life. I'm a child of God. That is the mark. And I have this divine nature that's not of me. Because my righteousness is dirty rags, right? But it is the righteousness of Christ living in me. And that mark of his righteousness. I live a godly life. It's not about following rules or, oh, i got to do this or i got to do this. And, and we get you in the headlock at this church and say, man, if you want to be in this church, you got to do it. It's nothing like that. It's because Christ lives in me. That mark of his divine ship in my life, empowerment of his life, I live a godly life. That's all. No excuses. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ in this room today, there's no excuse. When you stand before him, doesn't the Bible say that you're as if you're naked? There's no excuses. Because he's empowered us by his nature and by his power to live a godly life. Read that verse 4 over and over until you understand this. So here it is, last time. How do we get this? Somewhere along we have to believe this, this message today. We have to start believing some of the things we've said in verses 1 through 4. We have to believe that we're on this equal ground. That when we, if, if you've not come to Christ, I'm not talking to you right now. I, I'm just not talking to you right now. But let me tell you, if you're not a believer in following Jesus Christ, let me tell you. Right now, even though you don't know anything, you don't know theologically about about tr the Trinity, and you don't, you don't really kind of fully understand it, why would God send His Son? You may not fully understand all this, but by faith you must come into this relationship. By faith you come and say, Lord, I, I, I don't understand everything, but I know you love me, and you died for me, and today I accept you by faith. Here's what's going to happen to you if you'll do that today. You'll walk out of those doors changed because of the promises of the Word of God. Amen? Yeah. And because of that, we're the same. All of God's promises are in you right now. When you, when you believe that and accept that, all of God's promises are in you, just like they are in me. You don't have to go to seminary for that. That ain't good. <laughs> you don't have to be a Christian for 55 years, no, 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 45 years, like me. You have just the same thing in you that I have. Isn't that, isn't that crazy? That's craziness. But that's the Word of God. That's how He loves us. But if you are a believer, you must understand that because of Christ and His righteousness and because of that faith and that trust and the knowledge of Him, you have faith in Him. And that faith is the same faith that, that faith that helped Peter walk a few steps, but also to do unbelievable things for the kingdom of God. You also have grace and peace in your life. It's multiplied. The closer you get to the Lord, the more peace you are with things around you. Amen? That's a promise. There's also this, this, this promise also of the, the, uh, this, uh, when we have this knowledge, this intimacy with the Lord, that the promises of God are fulfilled in us and that no matter what comes our way, that, that no corruption can take us because He has empowered us with his righteousness. He told them his righteousness. You know, I, I just really believe this, and, and 
I just think that you know the, the key to all this is, is just this intimate relationship with him. I want to I want to encourage you this week to do this. Okay, I'm done. I want to encourage you to, to keep reading <laughs> Second Peter chapter one. I really want to encourage you to read it several times this week and let it soak into you what what the Lord is speaking in these things. And also, I want you to walk out of this room saying, you know what, I'm really going to believe what I've heard today, what i read today. I'm just going to believe it. I may not see it in my life. It's just kind of outside of my personality. But I'm really going to trust the Lord today. And I'm going to walk out of here empowered by this word, what it says over my life. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, for the faith and the grace and peace and Godly life, the promises in this divine power, divine nature that you have given to us to walk in your grace. We really do trust you. Yielded our lives over to you. We thank you for this amazing, amazing divine nature that lives in us, that we will be more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. And that we will overcome as the saints in heaven have overcome. Because Christ lives in us and empowers us by His nature and by His power to live a life of divine nature. Jesus, it's all about you. It really is. The finished work on Calvary. So we're so grateful for you, Christ, for on our behalf, you took all my garbage, my ugliness, and my sin, and you took that to Calvary. Once and for all. Lord, help me to see myself as you see me. The righteousness of Christ, and being a child of righteousness, and help those in this room to see themselves as you see us. Empower us to live, leave this room Knowing that the Christ, you really do live within us. Empower us to live that faithfulness and fruitfulness until you come again. And for that, we're grateful. Lord, for anyone that's here that does not know you as their Lord and Savior, I pray that today that they will they'll, they'll, they'll yield their life and their hearts over to you today. That they'll not walk out of this room still frustrated and trying to do the best they can. Let them fully realize that they can't do it on them. They must yield their life and their heart over to you today. Father, it's been good to be in your house today. We thank you for your word. May your word richly bless. We pray for those that are here and those that, that are absent. We just lift them up to you. And we just pray your grace and your mercy will endure forever and ever. We pray for next Sunday for a great celebration of Easter. We're grateful for the opportunity to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. For that we pray in His name. Amen. 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 Thank you.